If you haven't watched this 1945 British thriller classic, you are in for a treat. The word classic itself relates to the idea of idealized form. And this is a film where exquisite form emerges out of the everyday conventions of people gathered around a fire to tell stories to each other. The structure is that of the anthology. There is a central story, in this case, the parlor of an English country house where the gentry, who all know each other, have invited two strangers. One is an architect who comes to consult on renovations to the rustic house. The other is a psychiatrist with a Viennese accent who gives his last address as the Netherlands. The architect has a vivid sense of deja vu. He is convinced he has met everyone before, including the psychoanalyst, Dr. Van Straten, who he senses will become, for no apparent reason, an antagonist. In response to his deja vu, the other guests tell stories about their own encounters with the supernatural. After each tale, Van Straten weighs in with a scientific explanation, the perfect foil to get the audience on the side of the storytellers. It is easy to watch Dead of Night as a simple thriller, with no other aim than to entertain an audience with a series of spooky stories about the supernatural. Its simplicity conceals the fact that it is exquisitely crafted. Each tale has an economy that leads us directly into theoretical issues about how suspense works in real life, almost as if we are given visual and narrative formulas for constructing the subject's most fundamental relationships to meaning. I therefore am proposing that we regard this film as an encyclopedia in relation to a term I will define as the logic of the dream, and by extension, the broad range of ethnographic expressions of the uncanny. We can use Dead of Night to do a little house cleaning in theory about psychoanalysis and architecture. I think many of these new terms will be new to most theorists. Some have connections that have been a long time coming. The Slovenian theorist Mladen Thaler, for example, has called for moving anamorphosis out of its visual functions to embrace the whole of human subjectivity. I applaud this suggestion, but I would add that we must first understand the way anamorphosis is logically anticipated in Lacan's theory of metaphor. And to see this, we have to go back to the relation of the dream and fantasy to waking reality. I build on the fundamental functions of the figure ground relationship to show how the dream's aim of keeping the dreamer dreaming without breaking the spell that Euclidean geometry holds over perception, a process that goes by the very unfamiliar word idempotency, enables a view of how the uncanny phantasmagorias of the dream can be broadly distributed under the name of latency. Latency may be another word for repressed contents, or even the unconscious, but its materialities of submersion, concealment, camouflage, and other subliminal conditions allows us to consider a broad range of examples to extract an inner logic, a logic I connect with projective geometry. My main thesis is very simple. It's that waking and dreaming differ in the figure ground relationship reverses. This is because the dream must keep the dreamer paralyzed. And although the dreamer imagines wandering around and over a fixed field, it is actually the field that is moving across him or her. The dreamer's ignorance and denial of this reversal leads to effects of phantasmagoria that can be distributed in the waking world outside the dream, thanks to the subject's belief in Euclidean accessibility, that everything in principle can be perceived. It impotency is, as the word suggests, the power to stay the same. The dreamer does not have to move, 
Latency is the cover needed for transfers of uncanny effects of the dream into the waking world. At the same time, I introduce new terms such as phantasmagoria and idempotency, and new connections such as between metaphor and anamorphosis. I want to stick close to the Lacanian theory of the subject. My theoretical project allows me to have a new take on some standard ideas, such as the mirror stage. Beginning with Lacan's general assertion, which I paraphrase here, fairly, I think, as the subject is structured by the mirror, I take a sudden turn from the standard issues to consider that a mirror cuts space in two. Graphically, the human world that was 360 degrees is cut into two domains of 180 degrees each, one folded over the other. But the point is that even when we are in spaces that don't have mirrors, the mirror continues to structure the world of the subject. The 360 degrees of our visual panorama is really 720 degrees of a space put together by the normal kind of virtuality that allows us to imagine the unseen side of things, plus a 360 degrees that is a kind of a virtual elsewhere. To make a full subject, we need both virtualities. We need 720 degrees. As two authors writing about projective geometry and psychoanalysis have put it, above the horizon there is no sky. Why do we need this extra 360 degrees, this nothing above the horizon? First, every direct experience of the senses is not only incomplete, it marks the edge of a fold, a fold of time as well as space, a fold across itself. This is because the subject is a subject thanks to language. The unit of language, the sentence, unfolds in time, with the beginning held in suspense until the end is reached. But then, a very interesting thing happens. The end of the sentence returns to the beginning to revise and complete the meaning of the sentence, sometimes in surprising ways. There is never a complete lock from the beginning and end that determines what will happen or which forbids rearrangements and replacement. There is always a space between the forward progress of meaning and the necessary retroaction, always a space and time that must be folded across itself. The name of this folding is metaphor. But before I explain how that works, I have to talk about the figure ground relationship. The figure ground idea is really simplistic. It's what makes us able to perceive depth in one way or another. Gestalt psychologists used to use examples where figure ground relations were at a tipping point, such as vases concealing faces, cubes turning in or out, or the head of a Gibson girl turned into a crone. The ability to distinguish figure ground relationships is central to human perception and probably deeply embedded in neural structure. So deep, in fact, that it shows how our psyche is tuned to depth relationships, if only for the obvious reason that distance plays a critical role in determining whether or not things are a threat. The point is not to show that figure ground distinction is something the mind must do successfully to have a proper and productive perceptual world. In dreams, the dreamer cannot move around. The field must be moved around the dreamer to preserve sleep and keep the dreamer immobilized. The dream must fend off external stimuluses. When it can't block them out, it must incorporate them into the content of the dream. The dream is like the computer server that is experiencing what is called a denial of service attack when hackers flood a website with thousands of simultaneous requests. It impotency, which means the power to keep things the same, must detect such attacks and neutralize everything past the first wave. Phantasmagoria, which originally was a theater term, is used to create a patch. 
Phantasmagoria runs against the rules of Euclidean space and time to insulate the dreamer from incoming fire. The aim of the dream is to keep the sleeper asleep. The figure ground function lies very deep within our neural structure because it's the basis of our sense of balance and ability to estimate position and distance. But because it's so deeply implanted, the phantasmagoria is able to get to the central circuiting, so to speak, and migrate into our waking experiences. Here it is able to exploit weaknesses in the perceptual system, our reality brigade. Waking experience is far from being rational. Thanks to the folded structure of space and time and language, the imagination has the power to consider the what if of anything obvious. Any word, thought, or idea is subject to replacement, adjustments, or even whole revisions of the backgrounds that frame our perceptual judgments and plans for action. Lacan used the idea of metaphor to explore the logic of these revisions. To be clear, it's not the case of having a single literal reality tweaked by metaphorical replacements. There is no literal reality. Without the replacement process, there would be no possibility whatsoever of any human experience. The folding is essential. The 720 degrees is essential. The latency that allows for this folding and the anamorphosis that is the result of this folding are essential. We're not talking about a normal world plus uncanny exceptions. We're talking about a basis phenomenon, as the philosopher Ernst Cassirer would put it. I will show how the figure ground function is critical for knowing whether we are awake or dreaming, or, as in the case of the dream, the illusion that we are awake while we are sleeping. In this case, the condensation that Freud cited as one of the two main functions of the dream comes in close contact with the condensation function of metaphor. This is where things get exciting. This ground is prepared, so to speak, by the way substitutions are allowed to alter what we expect in line with the Euclidean normal, perspectival views of reality. We can use the sentence, which is effectively the unit of meaning, to talk about this order and our expectations of how substitutions can be made. Think of this unit, a simple fold over in the most basic sense, as an atom that is able to move between two molecules, one awake and the other sleeping, a kind of Argus duplex. Argus was the giant with a hundred eyes, half of which could close and sleep while the others remained open and awake. Condensation happens in dreams, but on the level of the sentence, it happens grammatically in the way that the first of the sentence is not known until the last presents itself. Then meaning must fold backwards over the forward temporality of the syntagmatic order. In this way, paradigmatic substitution creates a figure ground relationship that is very much open to idempotency. If we imagine a Euclidean traveler, a Waldo, making a trip around the world, the function of the mirror would have the distance traveled by Waldo, but Waldo would not notice. He would arrive back at his starting point upside down, not fully upright as he imagines he should be. Waldo has been pressed into the mirror from the beginning. Waldo exists only as a spectral Waldo. The mirror has made him more real than any Waldo standing on the outside. So it is the reflection that is deprived, the reflection that lives in the mirror's deep space. Waldo thinks he's a real person, of course, so he experiences this inversion as something uncanny. Logically, this is a situation of being given a forced choice. If you do one thing, the other option is entailed. In the robber's classic demand, your money or your life, you cannot enjoy your money without your life or your life without your money. The situation is structured around your loss or lack, although you 
are pretended to have freedom. The missing 180 degrees has subtracted your freedom while it is claiming that you have it. You move in one direction to escape, but you lose as many steps as you gain. This leads us to an important story from antiquity. It shows that this idempotency condition, the subtraction of half a space by the mirror condition, has been known since the beginning of human cultural life. The story of Daphne and Apollo is classic. Apollo criticizes Eros's bad archery skills. It seems that all the wrong people fall in love, or when they do, they don't want to, or at least not with that person. Eros decides to play a trick on Apollo, so he shoots him with an arrow that makes him love Daphne, and shoots Daphne with an arrow that makes her hate Apollo. Maybe it's the same arrow, one with two points, and maybe it travels in both directions at once. If you can imagine that, then you can imagine what a projective line is and how one point is also its antipode. Daphne runs, but she cannot hide. Her very fright generates the trap, which is a 2D surface that has no boundaries, but is still finite. Daphne defines a surface much like the Mobius band or Klein bottle. It doesn't have any exit. The only option is transformation. Daphne converts into a tree. This is the idempotency solution. Trees do not move, but thanks to this, they branch out. They become a fixed ground against which figures proliferate. Given Daphne's problem, idempotency, becoming a ground over a figure rather than a figure over a ground, was her only solution. A disturbance leading to phantasmagoria can be simulated in the classic Cretan liar framing paradox. In the sentence that reads, there are three errors in this sentence, there appears to be some mistake. The perplexed puzzle solver then realizes that the third error is that there are only two errors. But of course, if there are only two, then the claim is false. But the third means the claim is true but this runs against the claim's literality. When Lacan says there is no such thing as literal meaning, he literally means that this reflexive structure exists elsewhere in all of human life. The metaleptic engagement of the frame, which disallows our relaxed enjoyment of a stable idea of a figure on the ground, is overturned when we retroactively consider the possibility of the third error, which requires us to move the ground over the figure. In the film Dead of Night, the opposition of the visiting stranger architect to the visiting stranger psychoanalyst, we have the classic ploy of enlisting the sympathy of the audience in favor of the dreamer who challenges convention. The other guests quickly get the upper hand by siding with the architect and his deja vu claim. They add their own stories of uncanny encounters, and one story after another weighs heavily in favor of the supernatural. We almost forget that, if we agree with Craig, the architect, that his moment is inside his dream, then we must also accept that Van Straten represents the forces attempting to wake up the dreamer, but that Craig is also dreaming him. So the dreamer is attempting to continue dreaming by including inside the dream a representative of the forces that would wake him up if left outside. There is a fairy tale rhythm to the dead of night that, like any tale of the supernatural, calms us by administering mild frights in controlled circumstances. The anthology structure is so canonical and so hypnotic that when television reruns of the film tried to admit the silly episode, The Golf Ghost, the whole film became boring and repressive. When it was returned, viewers felt a sense of order and comfort. We have to consider just how structure itself is a part of the Dead of Night's function as an algorithm of idempotency, something that strives to insulate us from external disturbances.
There are many things to say about this film, but the tale I'll be focusing on is about a mirror given by a well-to-do socialite to her fiancé, a mirror which turns out to be haunted by its previous 19th century owner, a wealthy landowner immobilized by a riding accident who strangled his unfaithful wife. The mirror continues to reflect the bedroom of its former owner, but this latent reflection is visible only to the fiancé, who thinks he is losing his mind. There are three interesting aspects of this tale. First, it is an opportunity to extend the idea of anamorphosis beyond its usual confines in the visual arts. The Slovenian philosopher Mladen Dolor has argued that anamorphosis, in fact, should be considered as fundamental to the structure of the psyche, in particular, the Lacanian psyche. Second, the mirror itself brings out a subtle aspect of Lacan's famous mirror of the mirror stage, the fact that the mirror's normal function in Euclidean geometry terms switches to a different visual logic at the mirror stage. When a young child finds that the image is its double, but that the double has different intentions and ambitions. Such is the situation with the fiancé, who begins to identify with the murderous former owner in relation to his own wife's frequent absences. His jealousy is inseparable from the specular fascination of the other room he sees in the mirror, which no one else can see. The haunted mirror tale actually tells us a lot about Lacan's mirror stage relation to two properties of projected geometry, non-orientation, the break from the mirror's usual perspectival duties, and self-intersection, where the mirrored subject suffers a radical case of misidentification with a completely other subject. First, let me show how the impossibly complicated math theme for metaphor is actually a map of projective geometry's 2D manifold. It does what Magritte's mirror does in successive operations that use latency in the same way that the dream uses latency to paralyze the dreamer. It is important to remember this paralysis. It is the way the dream defends the dreamer by keeping sleep protected against external stimulation. I count bodily disturbances as external, for in relation to dreaming, the dreamer's own body is something that is on the outside, a key piece of information if you want to understand projective geometry. This is a bit like the situation of the movie, The Truman Show, where a single character, Truman, believes that he lives in a pleasant town in Florida. But he is really surrounded by actors and in a set built inside an ecologically isolated dome. He is a dupe being filmed by devices that outdo Barclay's God to make sure that Truman never discovers the truth. This is Truman's Euclidean dream illusion that like the dream, aims to see how long it can preserve the dupe's imprisonment. Occasionally, a piece of production equipment malfunctions, which Truman interprets as uncanny. His desires are kept in line by the producer's schemes to provide a complete phantasmagoria simulating a normal life. But the uncanny breaks through enough to compel Truman to break out of his dream into something he can't imagine, a world where his fake freedom becomes real freedom. At the point where he is able to escape, the producer Christoph tries to persuade him that paralysis within Sea Haven is infinitely better than waking up to reality on the outside. The theme of paralysis in the haunted mirror tale is clear. The fiancé is transfixed by the mirror. Eventually, he cannot tear himself away. Like the original owner, he becomes an invalid sitting in the room with the mirror. Not his own room, but the room in the mirror. This is the central key to the logic of the dream, where the dream will do anything it can to keep the sleeper awake, 
fending off external and internal stimuli, converting them into elements of the dream. This is a physiological function, but the logic is passed on to the work of art, whose aim is to keep the audience in its seats. Immobilization forces space and time to move around the paralyzed viewer. But of course the viewer does not feel that, interpreting this motion as a phantasmagoria, open to intrusions from the future and past, as well as from the realm of the dead. The phantasmagoria is more ancient than we have recognized. One can trace this back to the Eleusinian Mysteries, enacted annually to celebrate the loss and recovery of the maiden Persephone. It is in this spirit of recovering something ancient and forgotten that I take an analytical look at the tale of the haunted mirror to see its structure and logic. Ultimately, this is a vindication of the theory of metaphor developed first by Giambattista Vico in 1744 and later by Jacques Lacan in the 1950s. This is metaphor that is not an individual instance of substitution, but rather the broad function of substitution itself, as constitutive of human subjectivity as a whole. Although Dead of Night seems to offer us a series of supernatural experiences, metaphor is all about experience and about how all experience is more uncanny than we have ever thought. As the dreaming architect of the film finds, the dream itself is able to simulate waking reality, and metaphor's logic of the dream makes us wonder if all reality isn't just an effect of the uncanny, not just a reality with cracks and gaps. I'm going to take an unauthorized approach to Lacan's Mathene and its official interpretations. I want to think of the terms as being in motion, of pushing each other, of creating more of a graphic situation. Metaphor in Lacan's terms is not just a word that replaces another one to create a poetic effect. It is a condensation of meaningfulness out of conventional meanings, and how that condensation is a trauma that must be incorporated, literally pulled into a body, in the same way an idempotency algorithm protects a website from a denial-of-service attack, or the dream protects the dreamer from external disturbances. Lacan's metaphor pushes a virtuality past the Euclidean limits of normal meanings and appearances. This makes it a kind of trauma by definition, but as it does so, it becomes a kind of efficient cause. The horizontal bar becomes the Euclidean limit. A signifier is pushed beneath it to be a signified, and then it drifts for a moment, a signified without a signifier below water. Or as Alice in Wonderland called it, the reverse of a cat without a smile, a smile without the cat. It is preserved by the fact that it's latent. The latency of the displaced trauma, pushed past our Euclidean awareness, is an open situation. Suddenly, like a drowned body, it bobs up in a horrifying way, just as the image in the haunted mirror suddenly emerges from the background to take the place of the ordinary view of the fiancé's room. The effect of the move is astonishment. The fiancé wants to know what exactly does the mirror want of him? How does this strange behavior involve him? Is he going crazy? In this one move, Lacan shows the presence of psychosis from within neurosis, our Euclidean normalcy. We see all this by the drowning, drifting, and sudden buoyancy of the latent signifier. The dot that looks at first to be an algebraic multiplication sign must also be something like an inversion machine. It forces a shift in a figure-ground relationship. In the haunted mirror story, the first owner's bedroom, a ground, becomes the figure that runs across the new owner who stands before it paralyzed, it impotent, like the dreamer in sleep, thinking himself still to be a figure. Algebraically, the two S primes cancel out. 
but there's more to the story. The dot, as an inverter switch, shows how these represent the double structure of the subject, which in Lacanian psychoanalysis is an S with a bar, which we now see is a signifier with a drowning problem. The bar separates consciousness from unconsciousness. Now we can associate it with the horizon that separates Euclidean waking reality from the virtuality that lies beyond it as a kind of space of necessity. The algebraic cancellation is really a merger of the latency position and the sudden haunting of the unconscious. As the reversed positions suggest, this merger is not a combination of two like things. It is a mirror split that combines opposite qualities, in this case, of speaking and being. Like Jekyll and Hyde, one detracts or limits the other, but each is necessary to the other. Because of this coincidence of opposites, the arrow sign becomes more an indication that something is being produced by this curious, contentious combination. The stuff on the left is productive. It creates situations, new forms, new configurations. It is like the blocking of a scene in a film production. Possibly, it's a model for all creative production. Dramatically speaking, the metaphor S is about the submersion and re-immersion of signifiers, resulting in something that appears in the material world. Process on the left gives us product on the right. But what is this product? Is it like an object, a work of art, a situation in space and time? Lacan does some strange things that run against his algebra playbook. First, the brackets to the right of the S, the metaphor, enclose a space where a new signifier-signified relationship is shown. But it is quite different from what we have been led to expect. Just as the dot as multiplication sign was actually a cipher for the way the split subject is a combination of the opposed forces of speaking and being, this unresolvable division is retained to the right to preserve a space from further change. The metaphor S creates, with a protected space of the brackets, a void. The fraction inside is something irreducible. By protecting this void and the space and time of the material world, Lacan simultaneously protects meaningfulness from the disturbing intrusions of meanings. He converts the X that we expect to see into an S double prime, meaning that this is a signified that will permanently and radically resist becoming a signifier. In other words, it will be something we always fail to put into words. The brackets are like the idempotent defense of the dream that keeps the dreamer paralyzed by parading the ground across a sleeping figure. But the dreamer will not notice. The illusion is that the dreamer is free to move as a figure moving across the ground. Is this the key to meaningfulness? Meaningfulness will be a part of the untranslatable real, not the conversion of the symbolic. It will be personal and significant, but something always beyond words. Another replacement keeps us from thinking that this might be a case of pure algebra. The one that we expect to see above the X, or even the S double prime, is replaced by an I. What does this mean? We know from other sources that the I stands for the ego ideal. This is one half of a composite idea. The other half is the ideal ego, the Waldo, who embodies our idea of what we want to be. But the two are like the Cheshire Cat and its smile. The relation is established only by the negative and antagonistic relation between the two, the actual person and the ideal that this person embodies. We don't notice it when, 
like the cat who is not smiling, we are not terribly concerned. It's only uncanny when we see the smile without the cat, the signifier without the signified. This can happen only if the figure and ground have reversed, as in the haunted mirror. This, in my view, is Lacan's genius move. He finds in the standard Freudian figure the geometry that allows the one to be replaced by the I. The ego ideal both is and isn't a companion to the idea of an ideal ego. Rather than being two sides of the same coin, the ego ideal and ideal ego are two coins with only one side between them. This is the projective plane of the Mobius band and Klein bottle, which we experience at the retail level as the principles of self-intersection and non-orientation. When we step back and look at the entire metaphor matheme, we see a mirror edge on. We are looking into what Rudolf Gachet has called the tain of the mirror. We are, as thinkers, commanded to identify with the latency that appears in recto and verso form, a latency that is durable, portable, and transferable. This is exactly what happens in the haunted mirror tale. We have agency in the way the traumatic image is pressed into the non-Euclidean depths of the idempotent mirror that first is forced to watch the horror of the murder, and we have the world to the right of the equal sign, where the mirror can be forgotten in an antique store, found by a prospective bride, given to her husband who fears losing her to another, and compelled to deliver its latency in the form of a figure ground reversal that paralyzes the new owner standing before it. This makes the meaning of the equal sign, which we thought to be quite conventional, the most uncanny sign of all. Lacan's Seminar 9 on Identity seems to confirm this view. This goes back to the question of identity and how in language the first of a sentence cannot be known until the end, a truth that causes every unit of meaning to be a fold of time in on itself, every attempt to say something, an act of origami contradiction. The arrow sign is nothing less than the double-pointed arrow, eros shot to inflame Apollo with love and Daphne with hate. It's the identity that must take up its residence on a surface of pain. The arrow sign is nothing less. So, in terms of the haunted mirror, we have demonic versions of these flips and latent pathways. A trauma is pushed into the depths of the mirror, past its Euclidean 180-degree obligation to reflect what is in front of it. It is easier to tell a ghost story prefaced by once upon a time than to parse out Lacan's complicated math theme. But we need to return to Lacan's precision to check our results. The metaphor and the haunted mirror begin with a trauma, and this will be something that Waldo will return to, but our old Waldo will enlist a new Waldo, who at first doesn't recognize the figure ground switch that has him standing in front of a strange room. The trauma has been pressed into the mirror, past the 180 degrees the mirror is obliged to return to the ordinary viewer. So this extra depth becomes the latency that preserves the image for over a century. When the right new Waldo comes around, its ground can communicate to a figure and convert him into a ground. The normally passive mirror becomes active. It haunts its new Waldo. The theme of idempotency helps to show how, in the story, haunting involves keeping the new Waldo fixed in front of its ancient view. The mirror fends off attacks from the fiancé, then the wife, then the husband's own common sense. Unlike ordinary mirrors we can walk past with Euclidean ease, this mirror magnetizes and holds fast any new husband with a tiny hook of jealousy that it can jerk and reel in. Why can't the new husband break away? He can't say. The room in the mirror is meaningful in such a private, idiosyncratic way that he prefers it to all the other signifiers in his life. 
Some questions are stupid if we ask them in the wrong circumstances. Can architecture be psychoanalyzed? Is one such question, and the cartoon makes fun of us thinking to ask it. But if architecture is a figure on a ground, it is like us. It can become a ground on a figure. It can be paralyzed and forced to watch some horror parading in front of it. The trauma can be pressed into its depths. Just like us, it can store this horror past the 180 degrees it is obliged by society to provide in terms of utility, shelter, and symbolism. The latent depths of architecture means that it, like the mirror, has an unconscious. But it also means that it impotency will allow it to store its latent trauma, to keep it for fresh Waldos. Examples are not hard to find. For example, think of Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, where a hotel manages to lure a struggling writer into its deep space interior and keep him fixed there. It even gives us the classic symbol architecture is reserved for talking about such spatial and temporal traps, the labyrinth where Jack Nicholson is finally killed. Our complicated questions become simpler and certainly more enjoyable when we turn to popular culture. But the bonus we get from this turn is that we realize that the legacy of the uncanny has also played by the rules that Lacan so meticulously assembled in his mathemes and topologies. These exist as a collective possession of cultures rather than individuals who enjoy the symmetries but cannot say what it is they have enjoyed. Lacan has an equally uncanny way of describing the situation. He would say, we don't enjoy the uncanny, the uncanny enjoys us.